Hey, it's Cherie here, the host and producer of Women's Running Stories. And before we get into this episode, I have a message about how to help you stay safe and seen over these darker fall and winter months. I know I find myself running a lot at dusk or even in the dark because the days are so short. And in order to stay safe, I like to wear running gear from Wazelle's Premium Reflective Collection. It's designed with runner safety in mind. It is both highly visible in the dark, but also subtly visible in the daytime. And that is thanks to the tonal reflective print that only shines when it's reflecting the light. They have shorts, tights, jackets, tanks, and accessories like hats and gloves, so you can literally dress from head to toe in really good-looking reflective gear. I, myself, wear these pieces often, and it does give me that extra sense of security knowing that I can be seen better. So I can stay safe, and I do not have to sacrifice the fit and the comfort and the extra detailing that Wazelle brings to all of their designs. This is a brand I have loved for ages, and these are go-to pieces that I love to wear this time of year. So check out Wazelle's Premium Reflective Collection. Of course, I will have a link to Wazelle in the show notes. It's wazelle.com, O-I-S-E-L-L-E dot com. All right, now on to the episode. Women's running, running, running. Running stories. My dad always thought that I was going to be a runner. Like he was convinced and like solely of his own belief. Like I would, I gave no indication of wanting to be like a runner. I didn't do track or anything like that, but he would always have me like go outside of our house. And there was like a stop sign and he would like stand at the stop sign and have me like run as fast as I could to him. And he would just like time me. And we kind of do that like every so often, like a couple times a week. And he was always like, you could be an Olympian. Like you're so fast. And like, he'd watch me play basketball. He'd come to my games and my tournaments and see how fast I was on the court. And I also played like flag football. I was the only girl in the flag football league. Hi, my name is Ari Hendricks. I'm 35. I live in Portland, Oregon, and I'm a 235 marathoner. Yes, in this episode, you are going to hear the story of elite marathon runner Ari Hendricks. It is the story of how Ari did become, in many ways, the runner her late father saw in her at a young age, despite the fact that there was zero indication from her at that time and for many, many years after that this was something she had any interest in doing. But before we hear more from Ari, welcome to Women's Running Stories. This is the podcast where women share their stories about their running experiences. I am Cherie Louise Turner. I am your host and producer. And this podcast is a proud member of the Evergreen Network of Podcasts. Now let's get on to Ari's story. Ari Hendricks does live in Portland, Oregon right now, but she's originally from the Southern California coast. And you're going to hear her mention that she went to university in Minot, and that is in North Dakota. There are a few things to know about Ari's running journey. One is that she is currently supported by Wazelle through their Underbirds project, which is a really cool sponsorship program. It's a six-month contract to help formerly unsponsored runners with support up through the 2024 Olympic Trials Marathon which will happen on February 3rd of next year in Orlando, Florida. And just to give you a little context here, if you're not familiar with sort of how the Olympic trials figures into the marathoning world, getting to the trials is a goal all in itself. Because to run in the Olympic trials marathon, you have to have run another marathon under the Olympic trials standard. It's called running an OTQ or your Olympic trials qualifier. 
And back in 2020, the qualifying time was two hours and 45 minutes, which was tough. Coming into 2024, that time dropped pretty significantly. To be able to run next February in Orlando, runners have to have run a sub-237. As is clear from her introduction, Ari has done that, but it has taken her years to get there. And that is what this story is all about. Something else that you're going to hear Ari talk about is the list. And what she is referring to is the list that accounts for all of the American-born Black women who have broken three hours in the marathon. To date, there are 30 women on the list. And with Ari's success in the marathon, she is now one of them. While getting on the list was not Ari's primary motivation for going after a sub-three-hour marathon, the list has become more significant to her over time. She's going to talk about that. Oh, and before we get going, I'm going to have Ari introduce you to two fuzzy friends who you will hear in the background of the conversation every so often. So we have Casanova and Mabel. There are Lhasa Apso dogs. All right. So let's get to it. Let's get on to Ari's story, which actually begins long before she started running, at a time, in fact, when her athletic heart was firmly focused on the basketball court. Here to tell the story is Ari Hendricks. Basketball was my thing. Like, I really excelled at that. And that was my goal. That's all I saw was like basketball all the way through junior high school, high school, I went on to play in college, and then my senior year, I was an All-American at Minot State, but right before my senior year, probably like two weeks before my season started, my dad committed suicide. And that was like a really hard, like we had been estranged um, since I was like a sophomore in high school. Um, He had some like substance addiction, uh, mental health issues, and we lost contact. And like one of the the things that I like remember clearest of that season, like the minute I decided that I wanted to like dedicate my senior year to him was like, I had just had my first game and I flew home when I found out that um, he had passed away, but the funeral was delayed like a month. So I wasn't, I um, wasn't able to go back home for the funeral. And I had a game that weekend and I broke like the school record in assists and like had an amazing game on paper. And I remember just like sitting in a stairwell crying to my mom, like that I had played this game and I should have been home. And so it was like in that moment, I decided that I was going to play that season for him because he was a, always believed in me as a basketball player too. always thought that I was really great. You know, I could go really far and um, he was super supportive of me when I was a kid. I was an All-American that year, um, one of the top point guards in the country, and um, helped lead my team to um, an NAIA playoff berth. And then, yeah, I I struggled it post my season. I, like, continued to train and got invited to try out um, for teams overseas, but ultimately I did not get selected by any of the teams that had come out. And that was, like... The kind of the abrupt, heartbreaking sort of end of my career um, that I wasn't really prepared for. I'd I'd always had thoughts that 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 was what I was going to do. Like, since I was in fourth grade, like, I was going to be a basketball player and it didn't really leave room for anything else. But yeah, it was like heartbreaking. It's like the breakup you never wanted to happen and like didn't see coming and it just was like there and then not um, overnight. So um, after my senior year, I went home to California and struggled for like a solid year of like, I was still in school because I hadn't finished my undergrad. I was like working a part-time job, pretty lost in general. Like this would probably be like one of the first times I dealt with depression and anxiety, but like didn't fully know. And I would say like probably six months to into me being home, my old coach called me like out of the blue. And she was like, how are you? Like um, some of your teammates have come to me and like people are saying that you're like struggling. Like what if I invited you to come back to school and you were an assistant coach and then you stayed on and went to grad school. And like, this was like a big turn in my life, like inviting me back to 
to Minot and bringing me on as a coach and like allowing me to go to grad school. Like, I think I was headed down a pretty dark path and that really like brought me back. So I went back to, to Minot, moved back. And I was like playing, like I would practice with the girls and coach and stuff, but I was kind of like, there's something like, I, I need to find something like for myself, like something that I can like get into and like sort of put my focus on along with school and coaching and, and working and stuff like that. And I remembered that my dad always thought I was going to be a runner. And I was like, okay, like, you know, he thought I'd be a runner, but like, what could I do? Like also what's super hard? Uh, like, I don't know why I was like, yeah, what's the hardest thing I can pick? Like, I don't like running, but like, I'm going to do the hardest thing. And it was a marathon. And so I really went from like not running to running a marathon. <laughs> and I just like followed some like online stuff. I, I think I decided in like January for like a September marathon. And yeah, just kind of like trained. Like, I wouldn't even say seriously. I like trained and ran. I think I didn't, I didn't run like a long run over 16 miles. And then I ran the Bismarck Marathon as my first marathon with like the only goal in mind is to not walk. I didn't go in with any like time goals or anything like that. It was kind of like, if I could just do it and not walk, that will be like a huge win. And I will be like so stoked. Uh, I lived in Minot at the time and Bismarck, I think is like two hours south or west. Um, So I drove down, stayed in a hotel. All of this is like new to me. I'd never traveled for a race. I did not race before this marathon. Like that was the marathon and that was it. Um, so I did the whole like bib pickup and that was all new, but like super exciting. Like I was like really excited to like get this run in and do that. And I remember like I ran with like headphones and some like ASIC shoes, like basically basketball shorts and like a tank top and was like, I- I'm ready. And it started, I put on my playlist and I remember at the time, like my sister is a singer. And so I had her songs on my playlist. So it was nice like to have that and feel like she was up there with me and a part of it and I remember like probably mile I like it like finished in a park and when I got into the park after the last like loop it was so hard not to walk I mean I probably slowed down to like just a little less than a walk just like I and in my mind I'm like I told everyone I wasn't gonna walk and that's my goal and so that's that's what I'm that's the only thing I'm like gonna focus on right now and I crossed the finish line and my time was like 357 and change and I was like stoked I like I was like this is amazing I also like at the before I ran the marathon had no idea that I would like stick with it I thought that it was going to be like a one and done thing <laughs> like I didn't think that I was going to be like oh yeah I'm really I love this I'm going to definitely come back <laughs> and then it was like what can I do next <laughs> in the marathon like what what can a goal be next and then it yeah my next goal was to qualify for Boston <laughs> I was kind of like, all right, I did one. Now what can I do? And like, I can train even more. And like on my drive back to school, I like thought like, I was like looking, Googling things, right? Cause before this, I didn't know what the Boston Marathon was. I didn't understand there was like a qualifying time. And so like, I definitely had to like do my research. And I was like, for some reason, I also thought to myself, yeah, I can cut almost 20 minutes off my time um, in a couple of months and qualify for Boston for sure. <laughs> it's pretty wild like I thought like okay if I do some longer runs and maybe like workouts and not just running like and I had signed up for LA so Bismarck was in September and I think LA was in March of the next year and I was like yeah that's like enough time I'll get to go home and my family can come um and yeah I was like yeah a little bit more focus (laughs) and and maybe I can do that (laughs) I think at the time my my BQ was 335 and I ran to 332 so like um, a little over 20 minutes I cut off with like just like a little more focus and I remember like this is like one of my best running memories is like if my sister had come to the marathon like I wasn't she like came down to LA with me and we like had a weekend and I like crossed the finish line and she knew what I was trying to do and I'm like in the like runner's finishing shoot and she's like hopping over the fence like screaming at me like you did it you qualified for Boston and like all this like she was like almost more excited than I was and it was so amazing um that she was like just over the fence like screaming at me <laughs> and I was like freaking out too yeah I'm just like I stoked I be cued like like 
Yeah, really, like, I didn't know, I still didn't, was, like, super new, so I didn't really know or understand that, like, that's a pretty, like, significant jump, or, like, yeah, maybe I'm pretty good at this, and I should, like, try more kind of thing. I would say, like, for the first few years of my running career, I was kind of just, like, happy to be there, and um, things just sort of got faster. Progressively, like, my third marathon, I'd go back to Bismarck and run 315, and so that was, like, wild, too. I, like, I didn't go there with any implication of like winning the marathon or cutting off another, like almost more than 15 minutes off my marathon time. It was kind of just like, I just kept running and (laughs) then it just kept getting faster (laughs) for a while. (laughs) Then it became like, you know, I ran 315 and then I ran Boston and that was like, that I wanted to like, that was like an experience. Like my twin sister came out with me. We had like a weekend. It was a super, like it was the year after the bombings. So there was a lot of like emotion surrounding the race and being there for that was like super special. But yeah, then my, then my running, I'd say became pretty like goal oriented in terms of like time. And I would like finish grad school and I'd graduate and I came back to California and um, started coaching like my local high school and managing the local running shop. So I like my life became about running, right? Like I'm working in a running store and, and that sort of thing. And then my goal became to break three hours and that sort of like jump starts the super, like super, super goal oriented stuff. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, I, I always, I tell people like, yeah, it's like you qualify for Boston and then really as like a, a female runner, I think the next goal becomes to break three hours. And like in, in recent years, breaking three hours has become a huge goal for runners in in general. But at the time, at the time I couldn't see, I was like, not even the Olympic trials wasn't even like on my like radar, nor was I like in my um, own, own thinking like fast enough that that was even my thought process, but like three hours, I could sort of like wrap my head around like, okay, like that would be a, an amazing goal to have and something that I think is like achievable. So when my, when I was like, that's my next goal, I thought something pretty drastic has to change. Like I didn't, I think I'd reached a point where like, I couldn't keep following plans online and, and the, and like have it work for me. So I hired a coach and this was like the first coach I've, I'd ever hired. Like, I didn't really know what to expect, but like, it, I, I liked that like every week I was getting training it was geared towards me he knew what my goals were and so we were both like I felt like I had like a team tour sort of thing and I tried to break three hours I want to say like twice before I actually did I tried at the Chicago Marathon when I think I ran like 308 or 307 and then I tried at the OC Marathon and I again ran like 302 four, three Oh five or something like that. They were like in the three O's that I like, wasn't breaking three hours. And I was like pretty devastated. Like that was like a huge goal. And I was like, man, I don't know if I can do this, but then uh, I would eventually break it at the Ventura marathon, which at the time I was living in Ventura. It's where I'm from. I think I just sort of like became like really like I'd been ingrained in the sport, but like, I think like there was a commitment level that like went up So I spent like months, I would train on the course, all of my long runs were done on the course, I was getting up and running from Ojai to Ventura at like 5am on Saturday mornings, to break three hours in the marathon, like in the dark, my friend would ride his bike next to me for 20 miles. And we'd like park the car in Ojai and run down to Ventura. And I was going to the track for workouts, which I did not do before. And just like day after day, committing to running I th- and like running more days than I ever was before. And yeah, it like sort of changes the whole structure of like my day to day life type of thing, getting, trying to get enough sleep. I'm not like a good sleeper, but trying to get more sleep and just being more intentional, intentional, intentional. There we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> intentional with what I'm doing and, and how I'm, and how I'm doing it too. And like what paces I'm running. I was obviously training in Ventura. So I was surrounded by like friends and family and people would see me like running on the beach path and my training just sort of started to click and I was super I wasn't I wouldn't say that I was like super confident but I was like confident enough that I should be able to to break three hours at Ventura it was like a if anyone's run it it's like a downhill pretty downhill course 
you start in Ojai, California in the mountains, and then you run into Ventura. And yeah, that was like, I remember just like, it's on a bike path for a majority of the race and it comes, you come down into Ventura and I just sort of like locked in on this 652 pace and at mile 20 where it flattens out, I just like took off in a way that I'd like never taken off in a marathon. Like, I think I was clicking off like 620s to 630s for the last like 10K and I knew my like entire family was going to be there. And this would be the first time or like, no, the second time my family, my whole family was at the finish, like, like my mom, my stepdad, my twin sister, my older sister, and like uh, my nieces. And they were all just like screaming as I like crossed the finish line. Like there's like gates up before the finish line. And I saw them out of the corner of my eye and I like ran over and gave them high fives before I actually crossed the finish line. And so that's like a super like, amazing moment that I've had in my running career and I ran like 257 and I was like on top of the world I was like holy smokes I can't believe I just did that and to have them there was super special um so yeah it was like a lot of months of training on the course really learning it learning the pace and um I think having a coach is really what like changed that in terms of like being able to do that Um, after I ran 257, really, that's when I was like, the trials are the next, like, that's the, that would be the next most sort of logical in my mind step of like, in terms of a goal. Um, it was 2018 at the time. So for the 2020 trials, it was 245. And I was like, okay, like that's like fast, much faster. But like, I don't think it's like outside of like, I don't think it's crazy to shoot for that. I would switch coaches in 2019 and I would uh, try for the first like my first qualifier at Indy in 2019. I was coached through the McCurdy trained program who like I who I also coach for now. Um, Sydney DeVore would become my coach. I was running seven days a week, six, six to seven days a week. So yeah, my training became that much more intense and I went to Indy really believing that I could run the trials standard. What I didn't account for was that I was coming from California and Indy that year was like 30 degrees. So I, I was like totally unaware of like what that would feel like. Like I was like shocked almost, but we went in with like the plan of like, okay, if Indy doesn't go well, I was signed up for Houston in January because that Olympic trials year was in Houston still counted. Um, you could still run the trials in February. Um, so at Indy, I would drop out at mile 16, uh, like could not finish the race. And like the pace just went from, I thought I had it to like, not at all. And that was like devastating. That was probably the most devastating thing that had happened yet in like, in terms of like running and like a goal, goal reaching. I remember just like freezing in this person's car on the side of the race for like, an hour waiting for like the bus thing to come pick us up and take us back. And I was just like, I was left with like, man, I don't know if like I can do this, but I knew that I was going to try again in like eight weeks. <laughs> so in between Houston and Indy, I flew out and I, for like a week trained with my coach with Sydney. Um, she watched me do workouts. She did my like simulator with me. And like, again, thought like I had, I'd run the simulator perfectly. I hit the paces. Like every indication was that I should qualify in Houston. But like a, a lot of people know, the marathon is pretty unforgiving. And just because workouts go well doesn't mean that the race is going to go well. And by halfway, it, it was just like I shot off the back of a cannon. Yeah, I just like at halfway, the wheels fell off. And I still PR'd. I ran like 252. But again, like not what I went for, super devastating. It was a hard way to run a marathon. Like I only got slower and I like, I had no answers. I remember like sitting in or in the lobby of the my hotel in Houston, just crying, and, like not knowing what to do. And like, there's nothing that like your coach can say to you because it's like, we both thought that I was going to, that I was going to do it. Um, 
And yeah, and that was like, that was the end. That was the last chance too. Like there was no more chances. So I finished the race PR'd, but at that point I was like, I didn't really care about a PR. (laughs) So I ended up moving to Detroit um, uh, to be the training partner of my coach. And I moved there in March of 2020 and obviously COVID hit. So I was like, I was going to run Pittsburgh that year because now, even though the trials are over, my goal is still to run the Olympic, the Olympic trials standard. Cause I'm like, well, it's still a step. And like, obviously the trials are going to come back around in four years. We don't know what will happen with the time then. So I moved the like second week of March to Detroit and we just got like, we started training like this would be the highest mileage I've ever run. I was running like 115 to hundred miles a week. Obviously Pittsburgh would get canceled, but I would say like a week before I decided a week before that I was going to run a virtual Pittsburgh on the day that the marathon was supposed to be. And I was like, yeah, I'll like, let's still try and run sub 245. And so Sydney ran with me and paced me for that. And I ran like 244, like three months too late <laughs> in in a neighborhood in in Gross Point, Michigan, like looping around with um, two friends on a bike. <laughs> I remember like I thought I didn't cry, but I was like, I remember putting my hands over my mouth like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did that. Like I because even during that, like at 18 or like halfway, I had set a, a half marathon PR at halfway, I said a half marathon PR, and I was like, wow, you're really not supposed to do that in a marathon. Like, this could make for, like, a really tough second half. <laughs> and it got, like, super painful, but, like, we created a playlist. We had the playlist going the whole time of, like, songs. And it was just, like, I got done on this, like, random street. There's no finish line. It's, like, my watch is just – I'm just waiting for it to get to 26.2 so I can, like, stop it. And it was, like – almost like validation. Like I can do this. Like I can run this fast. Like I I wasn't crazy to think that for Indy and for Houston. And yeah, it was just like, wow, like I did that. Like finally. So after I ran the virtual 244, I spent the next two years pretty much injured. I would find out like three weeks later that I had a stress fracture in my tibia. And then I would get like two sacral stress fractures So not a lot of like, I didn't have like consistent training for the next two years. And Bayshore last year was like my first marathon that like I trained for and like was able to complete. And between the time that Ari ran that virtual marathon and when she would run the Bayshore marathon in May of last year, 2022, first of all, she had become well informed about the list. And during that time, the new Olympic trials qualifying time had been announced. And so, but I knew when the time came out, I was like, I was not surprised that it came down. My initial thought was it was going to be like 240. I thought that was like, okay, like logical. That would still sort of put a gap um, between the two times and things like that. So 237, I was like, man, that's quick. I was like, well, it's not going to be my next marathon that I run this, the, I don't, that's not my focus for like my upcoming marathon. I was like in the fall, I'll try for that and see like what I can do. So I ran Bayshore. And again, the goal was really like to run sub 245. I wanted to just sort of like get back there. And I ran 242 um, at Bayshore. And so that put me at like fifth on the list. And by now I know what the list is. I'm well aware and like that all of that is going on too. So I immediately crossed the finish line and knew what that did. But also, yeah, it brought me within uh, five minutes of the standard, which like, you know, I was like, man, that's okay. Still a lot of work to do, but a step in the right direction. Like definitely what I needed. Um, A PR on the day, fifth on the list. Like um, I still had like all summer and I had decided that I was going to run CIM in December. So it really gave me like as much time as possible in terms of like a fall marathon. Like, truth be told, I am not the most confident person. Like, it is definitely something that I struggle with. I would say that, like, going into Bayshore, I wasn't confident. I had spent two years 
injured. I My training for Bayshore was like pretty up and down in terms of like, I would wake up some days and just be like, I can't do this today. Um, I'd get like riddled with anxiety of like, I just, I can't do this. And I would like sort of not. Sydney was my coach still at the time. And it was kind of like, we, we just sort of like, let me sort of dictate how, like what I could do and what I couldn't do so that I could make it through the, the block like healthy and like get to the start line. The, like that goal was really to get to the start line. And I would say like pace and goal time were always to, to run around or like get as close to 245 as possible. But like really it was for me to get to a start line, which I hadn't done for a marathon since the virtual Pittsburgh. So yeah, I wasn't like extremely confident in myself that entire block. Um, I was kind of like scared a little bit of the marathon and sort of like getting it done. I wasn't having like exceptional workouts or anything like that. I think something that worked in my favor was that like for years I've been working on 615 pace. So the pace itself wasn't new to me, I would say. Like my legs certainly like knew what work at that was. But yeah, getting to a marathon start line healthy um, and sort of like ready to go was the ultimate goal there. I'm, I mean, I'm like, st- I, I still surprise myself in running because like, I'm always like, oh man, I don't know. Like, yeah, I never like, I'm never like, oh, I'm like totally going to blow this out of the park. Like even CIM, I would say that I did a lot of work at 555, but like two weeks before that, I was like, I don't know if I can even do this. Like, I don't know if I can run an OTQ. I don't even know if I can finish the marathon. And so there's all of that going on too. Yeah, it's something that like I still try and work on is building confidence and being confident in myself. And for Ari, building up her confidence looks something like this. Oh, it's a lot of like just reminding myself of like the work that I've put in and like what I've been doing and and how much I've been working at this. It's also like especially in races, I do this a lot. Um, like at later stages in races or like when it starts to get tough is like, I think of like my family and my nieces and like that they're either at the finish line or at home and like they support me. And I think about my dad and like, I imagine him at finish lines and like him watching me. And it's like, it, I don't want to sound like cliche cause it, I do, I really do mean this. It's not just about like me in terms of like, I want to, I want my nieces who are, one is going to be two and one is five to look at me and be like, I can do those things too. Like someone that looks like me is running marathons and like, that's my aunt. And like, I can do those things too. And I have another niece that's 25 and for her to see me doing this and like what, how sort of running has taken my life and where it's taken me and the things that I've accomplished. Like I want them to be able to see that and know that they can do anything that they want to too. Like if you had told me when I was, I don't know, eight that I'd be an Olympic trials qualifier in the marathon, I'd probably would have been like, you're nuts <laughs> kind of thing. And so it's like a much bigger than me. And I get confidence from them too, of like, they believe in me and they are rooting for me no matter what. And so it's like, when things get hard and I like, think I don't want to finish something, I'm like, okay, but my family believes in me and they know that I can do this. And so it's like, I use them for strength too, for sure. So CIM had been on my radar like since the summer and the training for that um, was approached like during the summer I did shorter speed segments. So a lot of like track work, which previous to last summer made me extremely nervous in terms of like I typically would get injured when I would start to do stuff on the track and doing stuff super fast always made me nervous. But to get my marathon pace down to 555, I knew I had to and we knew that I had to like implement that. So it was a lot of like time in the summer on the track and really my like marathon build started in September and it was just like, yeah, a lot of work at 555, a lot of like mile repeats, two miles, three miles, sort of building those tempos at marathon pace. I ran the Philadelphia half in September and I broke 120 for the first time. And then I ran the Detroit half in October and ran like 118 or one low, low 119 or something. And then my simulator at Indy was 1733, which is exactly marathon pace and also was a PR. Um, So I'd had like a string of good races going into CIM and things were really progressing 
well for me. So I went to CIM with like, okay, the goal is marathon pace at 555. That's an OTQ. But I also had to be super aware of like everybody going there to OTQ and like trying not to get sucked into like what other people's game plans were. But so mine was to always start out at 555 and just hold that. Like, um, I know there was like a group pacing slower than that. I knew that there was groups going out faster than that, but my game plan was always to go at 555. So, um, yeah, everything in the build to CIM went like basically perfect as perfect as it could. Um, I was running workouts faster. I was running longer, long runs. And I felt like I felt ready, but also I know that the marathon can be unforgiving and nothing is guaranteed. (laughs) Um, I tried to stay like as calm as I could and the rate, so see, I am, I'm on the start line and they start like yelling out all of the different pace groups for OTQ. And it was literally like six different groups. And I was like, what is happening? Like, this is so many options, but I sort of was like, no, I'm not going to like listen to any of that. I'm going to do what I know is like my race plan. And so the race like starts And it's like a slight downhill the first mile. And I was like, I found myself in one of the groups and I was like, oh man. And I looked down and it was like 545 pace. And I was like, no way. Like, I was like, I'm not, they're not getting me in this. So I like backed off. And that's when like big shout out to the Brooks Hansen women's group. They like came up on me and they were like, we were just like making small talk and they were like, just jump in with us. And I was like, okay. And obviously like Strava, like we can all see what we've been doing. And so I know that they've been training at 555 pace. I also know sort of like how that group works and like 555 is what they are going to run for the entire marathon. They're not going to like deviate from that plan. Like that's their pace. So I was like, cool. So I jumped in with them and literally ran with them for 20 miles, just like all of us in a group, just like, yeah, sharing the miles. And it was like nice. Like there wasn't a lot of like chit chat. But it was nice to just like be with familiar people and like people that I know that I can like trust that aren't that aren't trying to like they're we're all trying to do the same goal, right? Like no one's trying to outdo anybody else and we're all just trying to get the like standard. And it's just like nice to have people around you to sort of like not take some of the pressure off, but kind of. It sort of like lets you relax a little bit at times. And like, yeah, it's really sort of like I don't want like zen like or you sort of like can just like fall into your, into your like own space, knowing that around you, everyone is doing like the same thing. Um, and you can trust that too. So yeah, it's like, it, it, it's the first race I've ever done that where I've run with like a group, especially for that long, but we all knew what we were doing and like what the ultimate goal was. And so we were all just trying to like get there, like the easiest way. And like, the best way possible sort of thing. And like, you know, people around you or some people are running faster. um, Some people are slowing down. So it's like also just like zoning in on your, this group, this particular group of women and like what we're doing and really focusing on that and not all of the other like things going on around us. And then at mile 20, like we would kind of separate. Some of us would like drop back. Megan O'Neill from Brooks Hanson would like pull forward and like big ups to her. She had like a great day and a lot of them did. And yeah, I just remember like at mile 20, just remembering to like keep my feet going because it was at mile 20 that I really started to struggle at Bayshore and where like the wheels pretty much fell off there. Um, So I had been nervous about getting to that point in the race, but yeah, I just kept one foot in front of the other and, and CIM is like an interesting course because it flattens out the last six miles. And it's like pretty unfortunate because you kind of just see like I describe it to people as like the carnage of like 20 to 26 of like where people have clearly had a tough day and like people are struggling. And it's kind of like you're just kind of like trying to put your head down and keep going. And I was just like kind of doing the like marathon math of like, oh, man, like how much time do I have left? Like what pace can I like if I slow down, what can I hit? And I had thought that I'd seen the turn to the finish earlier than it was and I was kind of like trying to do visual math but I was like okay I think I'm like in the realm of being able like that I'm gonna do this I didn't know like how fast but I think I'm gonna hit under like 237 and so turning the corner and seeing the clock say 235 I was like holy smokes like 
that's like two minutes faster almost. Like I'm like totally okay. (laughs) Not like jaunted in, but like, yeah, like I'm definitely going to do this. It's not like a sprint to the, to the line or anything. Um, And I just like, I could hear people like screaming my name and I just was like, I was yelling down to the finish line, like screaming for myself, like, oh my God, I can't believe this and like pointing and yeah, it was just like, I don't know that I've had that much joy in a marathon finish, aside from when I broke three hours. <laughs> and yeah, just like crossing that finish line was like, I like, there's like a photo, one of my favorite photos, like with both of my arms in the air and I'm like pointing because like my friends and, and coach were at the finish line and, and they were all just like so excited. And, and my mom like called me right when I crossed the finish line. And so, yeah, it was really special. Oh man, the finish line was like insane. Um, we stayed there for like a little while cause I wanted to see one of the other Hanson women still had to come in um, behind me. So I wanted to see her finish, but it's like a lot of like tears and excitement and hugging. And I'm also like, do all of these people know each other? I, cause I don't think so. I think it's just like genuine excitement for pe- for each other and like happiness for each other. Um, that we all came out and did this like thing. So yeah, it's definitely a unique like finish line. I typically like don't hang out a lot at the finish line, but like we definitely like stood there for like a little while, like cheering people in and clapping for them and like congratulating them on their like achieving their goals and just like a lot of like crying. And we like watched, there was two women that like got in right before, I want to say like 2.36.59 and like, 236 50 something there was like two women that did that and just like watching them like just get to the finish line with like everything they have was like super super cool and exciting and um, yeah it was just like a lot of fun to be a part of for sure i definitely knew when i ran cim at the time it put me at in second on the list um and then obviously erica kemp ran boston this year and so um now third and she's first like super excited for her but i've met a lot of the women on the list i've met erica stanley dotton um shawana white uh sika henry so and they're they're all always so supportive and so sweet and it's that group of women is just really amazing and i i love that we all know each other in in a sense or like know of each other and where we've talked on social media but yeah it's really it's really special. I, I have bigger goals. Like I wanted, I definitely want to move up on the list. So like, those are my goals now, but yeah, being a part of that. And, you know, every time they, they, I see like how many women are on the list, I'm always fascinated that it's such a low number. So I definitely like want to bring like awareness to that and sort of like lift women, uh, African-American women, up and like let them know that they can be they can be on the list too and definitely want to support that and when I tell people about the list they're like oh my gosh like I can't believe it's not it's like they can't believe it's so the number is so low and so I think it's really an amazing thing to have and um super cool that it it's it exists and more and more people are getting to know about it so yeah like I definitely have goals for the list for the trials and um I definitely want to continue to support it and support the women on the list for sure. I was riding like a super high high at CIM. And then in February, I ran Mesa half and I ran 115 and PR'd. And I was like, dang, like I am on a roll. Like this is, this is amazing. And then I ran Eugene and it was like uh, awful. Like one of the worst marathons I think I've ever run in terms of like how I felt. And it was just a tough, tough day. And I kind of just like struggled throughout the summer to sort of like find my way in a sense. And like I PR'd in the 5k and that was like great, but like I was having trouble getting out the door and kind of finding like motivation to continue running. And then when I I applied for the Wazelle Underbird program and when I got it, I was like, holy smokes, like these people believe in me too. Like it's a whole, like, you know what I mean? It's like, oh my gosh, like that was like a dream come true. Like 
becoming like a sponsored athlete and having the support of Wazelle has been amazing on like so many levels. And so now I feel like I'm rejuvenated in a sense of like running is fun and people believe in me and are excited for me and like want to help me through all of it too. Right. Like I, not just like the physicality of running and like being fast, but also like, Hey, like how are you mentally? And like, how's everything going like with your mind, which is super important for me in particular and like how I work as a runner. So yeah, it's been like, I feel like I've been rejuvenated a bit. Now rejuvenated, Ari is looking to what comes next as she does her final build for the Olympic Trials Marathon taking place next February. I'll run a half in December in California as like a, my goal race for this fall. And then the trials, I mean, my goal is to become number one on the list. I, um, I've i planned out sort of like my weeks leading up to the trials. And so I'm going to incorporate a little bit higher mileage this marathon block and see how that works for me. And then, yeah, just like a lot of work at like 550 pace, which would be 232. So that's like my goal right now, 232. And then, yeah, if I can sneak under that, that'd be like amazing. But yeah, I would love to be number one on the list. I also like am super excited to like, if I can meet Erica Kemp, that would be great. I'm a huge fan of hers. So I hope that like we can run into each other at the trials. But yeah, that's my goal right now. And yeah, I would say like my marathon training block really started like last week. So I'm really sort of like getting into things now and yeah, I'll try and run a higher mileage block than I did for CIM, a li- only a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited to race in California leading up to the trials. And then my fiance and my family are going to come out to the trials and the two dogs will probably come too. So <laughs> it'll be nice to have everyone out there. And my family hasn't seen me race a marathon since I broke three hours. So that's exciting. Um, and yeah, it's just, I think I'm trying to have like fun with the trials, I'd say for like the last year at running is like, I've, I've struggled with it a bit, um, since CIM and that's okay. Like, you know, there's ups and downs. And, um, so I think I'm like falling back in love with running and sort of while still being goal oriented, I want to have a little bit more fun this block. So Portland is a great running community and getting out and running with different groups and people, I think is going to be a big, um, factor that I try and incorporate this time. Wow, what a journey. I mean, incredible. I am so excited to cheer Ari on for the Olympic trials and whatever comes next for her. Ari, thank you so much for being on the podcast and sharing your story. I mean, wow. And congratulations and good luck. For sure, I will be keeping up with Ari Hendricks and of course you can too because I will link to how you can keep up with her in the show notes. In the show notes, I will also link to how you can learn more about the Underbirds, as well as how you can learn more about Wazelle, the running clothing company created by women for women. And of course, they do so much more than make great clothing. Also, if you want to hear stories from other women who are on the list, we have episodes featuring Erica Stanley Dotton, Erica Kemp, and Sika Henry, as well as the great Marilyn Bevins, who was the first woman on the list. I've gotten to co-host two live discussions with Marilyn, and she's incredible. So I will link to all of those episodes in the show notes. I'm also going to provide a link to the list itself, and I want to thank Gary Corbett, son of the great runner Ted Corbett, for everything that he does for the running community and for founding and maintaining the list. One final link I will provide is to the documentary Breaking Three Hours, which highlights the stories of many of the women who are on the list. It was created by Tony Reed, who has also done a tremendous amount for the running community. And of course, in the show notes, you will find ways to learn more about and keep up with women's running stories, In particular, I am very active on Instagram. I want to thank you for being here and listening. I love making these episodes, but I always know that the power of stories is in other people hearing them. So, yes, I thank you for being here. 
Of course, I do not make this podcast by myself. All of the original music that you hear is created by Cormac O'Regan. He does that from his studio here in Cork, Ireland. And that is going to do it for this episode. I am Cherie Louise Turner, and I am coming to you from my home closet studio, also in Cork, Ireland. And until next week, I do wish you healthy, joyful strides forward. Women's running, running, running. Running Running stories. stories.
Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.